From the Sumire Foundation and Connor B. Judge Foundation, this is Demystifying NMO. Welcome back to Demystifying NMO. I'm Chelsea with the Connor B. Judge Foundation. Today, we're diving into all things on NMO-related pain. I'm grateful to have Dr. Shamik Bhattacharya, MD, neurologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital and assistant professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School. We'll cover pain prevalence in NMO, a bit of the science behind it, and then walk into the different types of pain those with NMO may experience. Dr. Bhattacharya will share treatment goals and how to manage NMO pain and offer complementary treatment approaches as well. So let's get to it. Dr. Bhattacharya, thank you so much for being on our episode today. Um, the pod's really happy to have you. Could you give us a little bit of context on how you see NMO patients in relation to their uh, pain management? First of all, it's great to be here and to talk about pain with patients and family members uh, who might suffer from NMO. Uh, I'm personally a neurologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital and a faculty member at Harvard Medical School. I'm part of the clinic uh, at Brigham and Women's Hospital which sees patients with inflammatory spinal cord disorders, of which NMO is a major part. As we treat patients with NMO, there are two phases. The first is the acute phase where patients get diagnosed and put on immune suppressive therapies. But in the chronic phase, as we follow up over time, pain becomes one of the primary symptoms, and dealing with it and managing it is about as important as dealing with the immune suppressing medications themselves. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's really important, and that's why we wanted to have an episode wholly focused on pain. And so, as you were saying, since pain can be such a main element or symptom of a patient's NMO, how prevalent is it exactly? There are about two series which look at pain and its prevalence in neuromalitis optica. And although the numbers uh, are not absolute in, in terms of very large series, it looks like more than 80% of patients with NMO deal with some type of pain that's constant and interferes with their life. Wow, 80% is quite a lot. And correct me if I'm wrong, is that um, on par with related diseases like multiple sclerosis or is that higher? It's higher than multiple sclerosis. Um, I think it is probably on par with chronic spinal cord injury from trauma. Okay. But it is more uh, than multiple sclerosis. And then as you said, if it's on par with these uh, spinal cord injury patients compared to MS, is that then because NMO has such an effect on the spinal cord, in contrast, in general, what we see with MS patients? Mm-hmm. Okay. This is a, a very interesting question of why pain becomes such a prominent feature in multiple, in, sorry, for in neuromyelitis optica, and what are the differences in the disease that cause it? There might be a few reasons. The first is that uh, what we know, just extrapolating from spinal cord injury literature is that injuries which affect the central gray matter of Mm -hmm. the spinal cord tend to cause more chronic pain than uh, injuries to the white matter, which are the tracks traveling up and down the spinal cord. And because NMO is inflammatory disease that often causes the central part of the spinal cord to be injured, it's speculated that that may be a primary driver for the chronic pain in NMO. You know, there are also other uh, mechanistic differences between multiple sclerosis Mm -hmm. and NMO, including the effects on the astrocytes themselves that they introduce, and whether that underlying biology predisposes to pain is also unclear. But the fact is that the central cord injury probably plays a role in the chronic pain and the modulation of pain. Well, thank you. That is a lot, and it's definitely a complex issue, and so we're grateful for your insight on it. And you, we focused a lot on how there's this primary aspect of NMO on pain, but I'm assuming that there's probably more indirect or secondary pain-related issues, maybe potentially from disability rather than, as you say, primarily primary from NMO. Mm-hmm. So, uh, in terms of uh, in general, for spinal cord 
injury pain. Uh, there are uh, multiple types of pain. And I think it's important as we talk about pain to dissect further into the types of pain that exist. Okay. So in the world of pain, we divide pain into broadly two categories, what we call nociceptive pain or neuropathic pain. So nociceptive pain is pain that occurs, let's say, if you break your foot. It's sharp, achy, worse when you use it. And that type of pain certainly can coexist in patients with NMO. For example, you get contractures in your legs, um, and that puts your uh, joints at different mechanical stress. That itself can cause pain. And it's important to address those aspects of pain as well, and probably look at it first because you can directly address them. The second pain, the type of pain, you might say with NMO is the what we call at level pain, meaning the level at which your spinal cord lesion, you can have a pain that mm-hmm. probably comes from irritation of the nerve roots and okay. connects at the spinal cord. And this is the kind of pain that people complain about, the bending kind of pain where it wraps around the body and it's a squeezing, bending pain ah. often present in the trunk itself. Okay, that is this what from, in, N- or in MS people would refer to as like an MS hug? MS hug, exactly. Okay. Okay. Uh, but, the, but this is actually a phenomenon that occurs in all types of spinal cord injury where at the level of the lesion itself you can have this squeezing, bending pain. Okay. And in larger cities, it turns out that this type of pain is even more prevalent or disabling in NMO and central cord lesions with injuries to the uh, entering nerve roots than in MS, actually. And then you have what we call below-level pain, meaning that it's not just the level of the lesion itself, but the parts of the body below the level of the lesion. And this type of pain is typical of a central neuropathic pain. So what do we mean by that? The patients often use descriptors, like it's burning, mm-hmm. it's tingling, it's cold, there's an electric-like sensation. And there are also other specific features. One type is that even sensation that is not generally painful is perceived as painful. Ah, is this <laughs> is this like hypersensitivity? Yeah, it's hypersensitivity. It's uh, sort of the technical name for it is allodynia, where it, things that are generally not painful are perceived as painful. Mm-hmm. And then there's also hypersensitivity, where even mildly painful things are have an exaggerated pain response. Wow. And and these are typically found below the level of the lesion, and it's a common neuropathic pain. And then the final part I'll put is that in any patient with chronic pain, living with pain itself is hard. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a disabling aspect of life, and uh, and it can be very taxing psychologically. And mood disorders can play a prominent role in driving perception of pain. Mm. So when, when there's depression or anxiety, or pain-associated behavioral responses, those aspects themselves can amplify pain. Uh, you know, we all know this to be factually true. Yeah. If you're having a bad day and you stub your toe, it hurts worse. <laughs> oh, than definitely. You're having a good day, right? <laughs> That's very intuitive. So, and but the but when you're in pain 24/7, those aspects can become much more amplified. So I think I, I would put that into the uh, to the mix as well and. You know, we call that sort of central sensitization, central pain as well, where in addition to all the other nerve aspects, the psychological aspects also play a role in intensity of pain and how patients perceive pain. Wow. So just as a quick review, so there's direct effects of NMO that cause pain based off of the underlying pathology. Um, and then there's these below surface con- contributions as well to pain. And then on top of all of that, there's these Mm, other uh, psychosocial issues as well or behavioral aspects, including depression, that can just elevate the pain. That's right. 
Wow. And when I think when I've seen patients like my brother, when they seem to complain of our experience, really similar to what you've also described, um, I know they talk about like different, like in, in layman's terms, there are different types of pain, um, like a, the burning that you've described through their legs and body. And then I know there's different types as well, like spasticity and rigidity. And I know there's more on top of that as well. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, one of the consequences of spinal cord injury is spasticity and spasms. Um, mm-hmm. And especially in animal, you can have what we call painful tonic spasms, where you have these uh, the, the clenching of the muscles with excruciating pain on top of it. Um, so that's another cause of pain. And the stiffness in the muscles themselves uh, can become exhausting and literally feel painful that the muscles are so stiff. So usually, when patients have constant pain, it's a mixture of not just of the rigidity, mm-hmm. but also of the nerve hypersensitivity okay. and the superimposed spasms on top of it. So that's why it's very hard to find one medication, sort of a magic bullet that will treat all the different causes of pain that exist in the animal. That makes sense. It's a lot of mechanisms going on at one time. That's right. Uh, And if I could make one other point about pain in an MO, and this is actually true for spinal cord injury, is that the nature of the pain evolves with time. So when you have an acute relapse, you might have, for example, cold sensitivity, where uh, if something cold touches your foot, it feels uncomfortable. But over weeks and months after the attack, the pain aspect can actually become more amplified as the uh, tracts and the receptors in your brain and spinal cord to realign with the new injury. So the pain can change with time and become worse. Wow. As if it wasn't bad enough. Um, So patients can experience all these different kinds of pain that have all these different types of mechanisms, which makes it really complex to treat. And I also know um, that the pain can get worse as all MS or MS and NMO symptoms can get worse when they're, when they get heated up. And what's that called again? UTOS phenomenon? It's, it's called UTOS phenomenon. This phenomenon is probably uh, most relevant for multiple sclerosis, um, where we think that in axons that are demyelinated, uh, just an elevated temperature itself will cause decrease in the function of the nerves. Themselves. Mm-hmm. So you might have worsening weakness, worsening um, uh, strength in, while walking, and other things while uh, if it's a hot day. You know, similar phenomena can happen in other uh, demanding disorders as well. Uh, but with the with NMO, it's often a much more destructive process. Uh, so uh, the UTOS can be a part of it, but uh, it, it's probably less profound. Than it is with MS. Uh, basically, because with NMO, they're already experiencing, uh, like you said, it's so destructive, such higher levels of pain that it can't go up anymore. <laughs> well, Maybe. <laughs> that's part of it. Uh, but temperature sensitivity is common in most neuropathic pain syndromes. So some patients have worsening heat sensitivity, others have cold sensitivity. So I think that itself also plays a role. Okay. So getting back to how complex all of this is, and you kind of already made reference to it, that because it's so complex and there's all these different types of pain, there's not like one magic bullet to treating it. But but based on what we do know and the treatments that are available, what do you as a neurologist try to do to help manage NMO-related pain? Right. So, you know, when you talk about all these different causes of pain, uh, the first response is how can you even treat it? Mm-hmm. Right? There's no single mechanism that underlies everything together. And I think it's a a great launching pad for realizing that the goal of treatment for a pain with NMO is to make symptoms livable and not to uh, resolve the pain. It would be great if we could, right? If we could bring the pain down from, let's say, 7 out of 10 to 0 out of 10, that would be fantastic. But unfortunately, most of our medications have far less potent effects. Uh, the benefits are much more modest. And uh, the 
conversation really begins with thinking about the goals of treatment and the treatment is to make sure that the, that you can function and you can do the things that make life enjoyable for you and accomplish them. But the pain will probably still be there huh. at some level. So I, uh, and, I, well, I just, I, you know, thank you for saying that. I think that that's very sobering and I think that most NMO patients would definitely agree with you. Um, but I also think it's just important to recognize because I think so much of it is about managing expectations and, um, right. And, it, you know, if you think that you're going to take something and it's going to make you feel completely better than, and it doesn't, then you might think that it's pointless right. and you might not take it, exactly. even though it is providing you some degree of benefit. That's right. And I think that's why we try to set expectations early, because otherwise you're not, you, as you said, you're not going to continue taking the medicine. It's not working. The, so in terms of pain management, I think the best centers, which do this well, actually have both pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic ways to manage pain that begin in parallel at the same time. Okay. Right. So, uh, so we can talk about the pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic aspects first. So, for the pharmacologic aspects of pain management, uh, we don't have large trials for pain that are specific to neuromyelitis optica. Mm -hmm. We extrapolate from clinical trials that have looked at pain management in chronic spinal cord injury as well as in other causes of neuropathic pain. Okay. Now, just broadly speaking, in the world of neuropathic pain, there are four classes of first-line pain medication. And mm -hmm. so those medications are, and uh, all of the patients with animal are like familiar <laughs> with some trials of this. Uh, so the first, uh, the four patients, uh, Medications are pregabalin, uh, goes by the brand name of Syrica. Uh -huh. It probably has the largest trial that has looked at uh, chronic spinal cord injury pain and with beneficial effects. It, and a related medicine that would be gabapentin, okay. would be the second first line medicine. There, there's less data for chronic spinal cord injury, but from clinical experience, it is probably effective. Then the other two medications are the tricyclic antidepressants, the antitryptyline or nortriptyline. Mm -hmm. uh, these are older medications and they don't have significant trial data underlying their use, but based on uh, common use from uh, neuropathic pain, they are appropriate medications. And the final medication is duloxetine, okay. which also has a mixed serotonin norepinephrine mode of action and has demonstrated benefit in neuropathic pain generally. So these are our sort of four first-line go-to medications. And it is reasonable to trial one of these medications mm -hmm. or combinations okay. of the medications to decrease the neuropathic pain. And I think this is where understanding the pain descriptors matters. If the patient says that, you know, the burning, tingling, uh, the electric aspects of pain are the ones that hurt the most, then I'll probably start with Lyrica. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, if the patient said that, you know what, it's painful spasms that I get, they are what hurts the most. In those cases, I probably start with a skeletal muscle relaxant, such as baclofen, cyclopenzaprine, and others, which cause, uh, which relax the muscles. Interestingly, some of the older anti-seizure medications, such as carbamazepine, also goes by the name Tegretol, mm -hmm. or oxcarbazepine, have a uh, benefit in clinical use in treating the uh, painful spasms. Okay, so it sounds like there's at least four of these main, as you're saying, uh, like first-line options, and it's really going to be tailored based off of a patient's individual pain needs. That's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And... You know, just to broach the subject because it's a because it's clinically relevant um, and has become such a problem in our country is with narcotics, particularly mm -hmm. opioids, um, and patients. You know, coming and having legitimate chronic pain and trying to manage it um, to live, but also not wanting to create a dependency or a dis a substance disorder. Do you have any insight on that? Right. So I think the. Opioids have excellent pain relief properties when used in a short run, but they do not perform as well 
when used in the long run mm -hmm. in, the, in different categories of pain. Uh, we saw this most recently in a very large trial in the VA population, which looked at opioid treatment for pain in both low back pain and knee pain. And if you and these are conditions where if you give opiates, patients feel better in the next few hours because it's a very defined cause of pain. And even in these populations, there are very common reasons why people take opioids in the long run, by long run, maybe 3, 6, 12 months, it, uh, the pain benefit did not sustain. Wow. Uh, so, uh, so I think the, the and in fact, the early trials which looked at opioids and led to its use were all short-term mm -hmm, trials. Mm -hmm. And so the way I use opioids is I have to use Something I probably prefer, tramadol, okay. uh, which is a mixed access antagonist opiate, but really reserve it for the worst pain episodes where you have you need something for severe breakthrough pain if there's a particular reason that the pain has gotten worse. But really, uh, to use it very sparingly, perhaps a few times a year, but it's not should not be the backbone of the pain regimen to be for chronic pain management. No, I appreciate that. And I think that it's just really important to highlight given, you know, the, the problem that is unfortunately developed. So to be very cautious and to use sparingly. Right. And the other thing I'd point out is that many of the NMO patients and patients with pain are also on muscle relaxant, mm -hmm. uh, some of which are benzodiazepines and it's the combination of uh, that can be opiates and benzodiazepines together uh, that creates the highest risk of overdose right. and risk of respiratory depression. So yeah. I think the animal population, particularly in patients with neurologic injuries where who may have spasms and are much relaxed, are are especially vulnerable. Yes, and as you had highlighted before, if patients are having any kind of um behavioral issue as well with depression or anxiety in combination potentially could increase their susceptibility for poor outcome. That's right. Yes. Well, thank you so much for having, I think, that more sensitive conversation with me, but I thought it was important to bring up. Mm -hmm. And so when you talked about, I think we covered the pharmacological pain management, and you said that there's also non-pharmacological management as well. Right. Um and I think this is the non pharmacologic piece is probably just as important and really needs to be done in parallel uh, with the pharmacologic piece. Uh, the first aspect is muscle stretching, right? So when we talk about muscle spasms, muscle rigidity, um, actually, it turns out that if you stretch the muscle regularly through the full range of motion, it can decrease the intensity of the spasms and can decrease the tendency to form contractures, for example, and worsening pain. Uh, so exercise regimen that you do every day that improves muscle relaxation mm -hmm. and improves uh, the tension in the muscle is important as a core feature of pain management. Now, the same thing goes for aerobic exercises as well. Okay. Um, and having an exercise regimen in place is also decreases the intensity of pain. And so I think these are often parts that are hard to do when you're in pain, but are important to do because it decreases the need for medications mm -hmm. and also provides another way for pain management that's actually good for overall as well. Right, um, okay. The, uh, the other parts are acupuncture, mm -hmm. actually have a, a benefit in other parts of forms of neuropathic pain. So oh, wow. uh, when things are, uh, you know, when we're in a hard spot where the medications are hard to tolerate, I sometimes often recommend acupuncture. So uh, unfortunately, the U.S. many insurances do not cover acupuncture therapy and it's uh, not an approved uh, mode of uh, therapy, but there, but you can, but there are now so many facilities, and you can ask around, and the pricing is very variable depending on where you get it. So I think most people can find an affordable location where you can get acupuncture and at least see if it helps your pain feel better. Oh wow, that seems promising. In, the, in addition, uh, I think there are 
all types of massage therapy and stimulation therapy, which are less tested. But uh-huh. I've had individual patients tell me that they are just as helpful. I mean, oh, oh, wow. I mean, I could understand. I think it's intuitive that if you're doing something that is relaxing and calming, that that might be able to help you manage your pain. But I think that, um, you know, it's really interesting to me to hear that maybe it's just as much benefit as one of the medications. Mm-hmm. And, and that's why I think that when we're talking about pain management, having a comprehensive strategy, mm-hmm. which synchronously uses medications, puts in as an exercise regimen, perhaps incorporates early on physical therapy and, and, and massage or acupuncture as needed. I think all of those things help achieve a better outcome. I think, and again, because, you know, when we talk about sensitive topics, at mm-hmm. the same time, it's important to think about whether the patient needs to see a pain psychologist ah, or the uh-huh. on as well. Um, I think uh, in our pain management group, there are pain psychologists embedded with the pain group. And uh, one of the things that predicts uh, worse outcomes to any therapy is what we call pain ca- catastrophization, where you feel that this pain is ending my life, I cannot oh, wow. function with the uh-huh. pain. And so if you change your attitude towards how the pain is uh, changing your life, that itself can decrease the intensity of the perception of pain. And I think it's important to understand that this does not invalidate their suffering Mm -hmm. or the intensity of the pain. We're talking about ways in which we can make the pain less impairing and uh, improve patient's function. So I think that uh, having uh, a pain psychologist accessible and using a pain psychologist early without the stigma of thinking that this means my doctor is telling me that I'm depressed and I need to see a therapist. I think those conversations, having them early, are helpful. No, I think that makes so much sense. And I think just being diagnosed with a chronic neurological disease can be really hard to overcome. And so I think it, you know, how you're going to learn to manage it, including with pain, is really important. Um, I was curious your thoughts. I had heard of some patients also seeking out cryotherapy to help with um, symptomatic management. Do you know anything about that or have any thoughts? Well, it's uh, it's definitely something that's offered. I have patients who do it and uh, and claim that they feel much better. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't, I don't no think science? That, that there's, there's not a lot of science. I think the same thing personal goals for using TENS units, right? Uh, you can buy them uh, online or at the store. Oh, I'm sorry, what was it? TANS This unit? is the TENS, T-E-N-S. Oh, okay. Uh, unit. It's a, a, a cutaneous electrical nerve stimulation. Ah, uh, they're okay. quite popular. Uh, but, you know, in randomized reviews of uh, these modulatory therapies, there's, there's no clear signal that it helps. Okay. Uh, but, you know, the problem with the aggregate data is that there can be individual patients who have substantial benefit mm-hmm. uh, that may not be reflected. So, uh, you know, I think as long as there's not a no lot of harm mm-hmm. to the therapy, I actually ask and encourage my patients to ask around. If, and if the patient feels invested that this might work, that might have even better predictor of uh, the therapy work. Ah, so, you mean like if the patient is believing in the therapy, maybe there's yes. just, okay. That w- and basically, if it doesn't hurt you and it's working for you, then do it. Then do it. <laughs> um, and I know that the masses definitely will want to hear this uh, next question, so it kind of in a similar uh, thread. Um, do we have any science or you have any clinical insight on using um, medical cannabis for pain management? Uh, that's a great question. The uh, I think the, for the medical cannabis, uh, its use has increased significantly as it has become more legalized. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, for example, in Massachusetts, we have seen increased use of medical cannabis in the last few years. And and my sense is that you know its ex- its benefits are modest, mm-hmm. and not just as with the other neuropathic pain medications. Okay. And it probably helps the most when there are spasms ah. as part of, as part of the uh, pain syndrome. Okay. When there is uh, the burning, tingling kind of pain, it is less effective. That's just an 
life experience. Um, but when there are severe spasms, uh, I think it's probably an effective medication. Uh, and I have many patients using it as well. So okay. I, I, I think as with the other medications, going it's not a cure. With, the, with the modest yeah. expect, expectation, it will help modestly. And, um, and, you know, it might help. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. I really appreciate your insight on that. And then I just have one final question. It's more related to these non-pharmacological um, mechanisms. But you had said that aerobic exercise is also important um, as a lifestyle modification. What about yoga and mindfulness? I definitely encourage yoga and mindfulness. You know, for the yoga, it uh, improves the stretching and the range of motion. Mm -hmm. exercises. And for the mindfulness, we know that uh, mindfulness exercises can significantly improve pain levels, no matter what the cause of the underlying pain is, whether it's cancer-related pain, whether it's uh, neuropathic pain from chronic injury. And I think this gets at the fact that chronic pain and its evolution is based not only on the site of the lesion, but also how your brain processes pain. And one of the ways we can modulate your brain processing is through these mindfulness exercises. So meditation, uh, mindfulness, I think these are all great Mm -hmm. ways to manage pain and make it more livable. Thank you so much. And since you're talking about mindfulness, I know there are a number of um, apps now that people can just find on their phones to help them learn how to meditate or do it. And um, I know there's like Headspace, which I think has a price, but there's like Insight Timer, which is free. So this is just a little plug to encourage people to do it because as you were saying, it won't hurt you and maybe it will help you. Right. It will certainly help your mood, uh, which will go a long way in helping uh, your pain as well. Thank you so much for joining me today on our pod. I learned a lot from this, um, and I know that the NMO community um, in general will as well. So thank you. Thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy schedule, especially during the era of COVID. We are very grateful. Thanks for having me. It's always great to talk to the broader community and hope this is helpful. I hope you also all learned from that episode. I certainly did. We discussed with Dr. Bhattacharya that NMO patients experience pain with prevalence of about 80%. We talked a bit about the why or the science behind NMO patients experiencing pain and how it's different from MS. And we talked about the different types of pain patients with NMO experience as well. Dr. Bhattacharya also shared treatment goals that all manages patient expectation to make pain tolerable and improve quality of life to learn how to live with the pain because unfortunately there's no magic bullet for NMO pain. We talked about types of treatment including pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic interventions which can include physical therapy and exercise. We also discussed complementary treatments which Dr. Bhattacharya said can be considered just making sure that they're doing no harm. And these kinds of complementary treatments can include acupuncture and a pain psychologist. Dr. Bhattacharya also answered questions on cryotherapy, medical cannabis, yoga, and mindfulness as strategies for pain management. So we hope you take this information with you and help it empower you. Thank you so much and hope you stay tuned for our last episode of um, our season one, which will be out in a few weeks. Thank you so much. And please, once again, find us online at sumirafoundation.org and connorbjudgefoundation.org. Also on social media at the Sumira Foundation and at CBJVNMO. Please give us feedback. Thanks, guys. (music) 